Hello everyone and welcome to History of the Second World War Episode 18, The Third Reich Part 5, The Election That Broke Germany. This week, a big thank you goes out to the podcast's new supporters on Patreon, Peter, Josiah, Frederick, Grady, and Michael. By supporting on Patreon, they get access to special members-only benefits, like ad-free versions of all of these episodes, plus access to special member-only episodes that are released once a month. Again, thank you. I would also like to thank listener Adam for their donation. The last years of the 1920s had been a time of growing political divisiveness in Germany. In October 1929, Gustav Stresemann, one of the more consistent voices within the government during the 1920s and leader of the People's Party, died. His party would withdraw its support from the Chancellor at the time, which was Social Democrat Hermann Müller, when they refused to cut unemployment benefits and reduce the national budget. This loss of support would cause the government to fall on March 27, 1930, triggering elections. These elections would be the primary focus of this episode. The elections of 1930 would be important to every political party in Germany, and they would be a critical turning point where the parties that did not support the continuation of the Weimar government and the Weimar constitution would transition from a group of small but divided parties into parties with enough support to meaningfully shift the balance of power in the Reichstag. Both on the left and on the right, these parties would gain support, with the National Socialists and the Communist parties coming out of the election as the largest winners. The ascendancy of these two groups in particular, and their revolutionary message, albeit quite different versions of revolution, meant that the Weimar government was in for serious trouble. In fact, the Mueller government would be the last that would be able to obtain a majority in the Reichstag, and for the next three years, the leaders of Germany would be forced to rule under the powers of presidential decree, which would cause a whole host of problems that we will discuss in detail in future episodes. All of these issues, and eventually the destruction of the Weimar system after 1933, would be rooted in the results of the 1930 election. After the resignation of Mueller and his cabinet on March 27th, elections were not immediately called. Instead, a new government was briefly formed under the leadership of Heinrich Brüning, a member of the Center Party. This was done by President Hindenburg under the assumption that Brüning would be able to form a cabinet that would gain majority support in the Reichstag. Brüning would run into problems almost immediately after taking office, with one of his first priorities being to pass a budget which would reduce public spending in an effort to balance the federal budget. This priority was rooted in Brüning's orthodox economic beliefs, which caused him to put faith in deflationary budgets as a way of bringing Germany out of its economic issues caused by the Great Depression. As a reminder, these deflationary policies were very common among world leaders at this time, so Brüning was not trying to do something crazy. However, those other world political leaders did not have to gain the support of the Reichstag, and in that body, Brüning ran into problems, because he could not gain support from the parties that he needed to pass the budget, including the Communists, the National Socialists, and other nationalist parties. Brüning would refuse to make changes to the legislation, and would instead take the opposite approach, threatening to invoke Article 25 of the Constitution, which gave him the ability to call for new elections. When this threat did not have the desired effect, Brüning put those threats into action, and on July 18, 1930, the Reichstag would be dissolved and elections would be set for September the 14th. In the National Socialist Party, the new elections were seen as a huge opportunity. There was a lot of dissatisfaction within the voting public with the state of the government, and the party, and really all of these strong protest parties, had been growing in popularity. In the two months between the announcement of the elections and the election date, the Nazi party would put their campaigning into overdrive. Just in the last month before September 14th, the party would hold 34,000 meetings across Germany. This large number is a testament to the administrative and organizational capabilities of the party, and the previous years of growth had prepared them for the massive expansion of their public profile in 1930. By this point, Hitler was not really involved in the details, being in a role very similar to the leader of any large party or business, providing a guiding philosophy, being a decision maker of last resort, and perhaps most importantly, giving a lot of speeches. While the Nazi party had always been fueled by a kind of fanatical belief among many of its members, to support this much greater pace of campaigning, it also became a party that required funding, 
a, a lot of funding, just like any other political party. When trying to gather this funding, the Nazi party turned to businesses, just like many other parties in Germany. But different political parties drew their financial support from different sectors of the German economy. The communists and the far left parties were of course not getting the support of large businesses. On the right, the German National People's Party, the largest conservative party, and the Center Party, the party supported by the Catholic Church, were able to get funding from some of Germany's wealthiest individuals who controlled German industry. Many of these wealthy individuals were still a bit skeptical about the Nazis' ability to grow their base of support, and so outside of a few exceptions like uh, the Thyssen family, the bulk of money given to the Nazi party from the business community originated from small and medium-sized business owners. This money was spent very quickly in 1930 for the election campaign, in both organizational expenses and salaries for party members. Of course, Hitler, quite publicly, did not draw a salary from the party, but he was well compensated for his time in the form of the party covering all of his expenses, plus very generous direct donations that were given to his person. When it came to the policies that the Nazis were campaigning on, they would join other opposition parties in having some pretty big advantages. They were able to criticize specific actions of the government and the political leaders of the parties that had been in power, which was essentially the entire center of the political spectrum. However, they were not required to have specific information about what they planned to actually do if they won the election. The message from the Nazi party and, and others was that the country was broken due to the inefficiencies of the Weimar government. Instead of offering specific plans on how to solve specific problems, Nazi leaders, right up to Hitler, focused their speeches on presenting a kind of utopian vision. They presented the idea of a nation united with one vision, of one that had destroyed class as a basis for division, a people with one destiny. They offered national redemption for the problems that had plagued the nation since the end of the First World War. While in broad strokes this message was the same that the Nazi party had been using for almost a decade, there were some differences in 1930. For example, there was a much smaller emphasis on anti-Semitism, at least at the largest party events, and events where Hitler spoke. This change was put in place due to concerns that anti-Semitism was not as broadly supported as the party had previously believed. One of the targets of the Nazi rhetoric was the Social Democratic Party. This was a multi-pronged attack, with one of the key pillars being an attack on the support that the Social Democrats had given to the Bruning Economic Plan, which would be called the betrayal of the working class Germans that the Social Democrats claimed to support. Remember, it was a deflationary plan with smaller national budgets, including less unemployment benefits. They would also claim that the Social Democrats were capitalist, who were under the control of a Jewish international conspiracy. The Social Democrats would be attacked from both sides, with the Communist Party also making the Social Democrats a frequent target. The two largest left parties in Germany would attack each other venomously during the election, and both would claim that the other was betraying the proletariat, sabotaging the unity of German workers, and even perhaps helping the Nazis. One of the only things that the two socialist parties, that being the Social Democrats and the Communists, could agree on was that the Nazi party was two things. It was actually a capitalist party, and it was in fact not socialist at all. This was a common refrain from German socialist parties at this time, especially when addressing working class audiences. They would claim that the Nazis only cared about the workers as a way of getting votes. Once they had accomplished their goals, they would betray them. Among the urban workers, this message seems to have worked pretty well. The urban working class was the target of a lot of Nazi effort during the 1920s, but even up to and after the 1928 election, they had done pretty poorly among this group. This was not the only area of possible expansion for the Nazi party, and even if the Social Democrats and the Communists prevented the majority of workers from voting for the Nazis, the beginnings of a total collapse among the traditional liberal and conservative parties presented another avenue for success. For these parties, like the People's Party and the German National People's Party, the 1930 election presented problems because their traditional message was not lining up with what most Germans wanted. Specifically, their message had always been one that did not involve drastic change. They were moderate parties that advocated for gradual change, not revolution. For many Germans who had such a negative view of the situation within the nation, these parties were not proposing the kind of changes that they hoped to see, and that they believed were necessary. 
Nowhere was the drop in support more strongly felt than in rural Germany. Rural voters had been a strong point for the traditional conservative parties throughout the 1920s, but it was also an area that was hard hit by the economic problems of the late 1920s. The biggest problem for the German farmer was the amount of agricultural goods that were being imported into the country, making it hard for German farmers to compete. This caused them to demand some sort of agricultural import quota, or at least some sort of tariff on any agricultural goods entering the country. The inability of the traditional conservative parties to make these kinds of reforms caused many rural Germans to be radicalized, and in this radicalization, they turned to more radical political parties like the Nazi Party, whose message of radical nationalism seemed to promise a different tactic in dealing with Germany's neighbors and foreign trade. For these two moderate parties, these issues meant that the 1930 election would be catastrophic, and between the two of them they would lose 47 seats in the Reichstag, and from a percentage basis, they would both see almost half of their popular support evaporate. When the results were tallied for the election, it was found that a higher percentage of registered voters had voted at 82% than in any other Weimar election up to that point. This turnout was important because of how Reichstag seats were apportioned. Seats were given proportionally, but the number of seats was dictated by the number of total votes, with a seat given to a party based on every 60,000 votes they received. This means that the Reichstag created as a result of the 1930 election had 86 more seats than the one before it, bringing the number up to 577. What this means is that the parties that gained seats did not necessarily steal votes from other parties. There were, after all, more seats to go around. It also means that the parties that lost seats, especially those that lost a lot of seats, had actually performed worse than just the number of seats lost indicates, because they now received a smaller piece of what was a much bigger pie. Four million more people voted, but three out of the four parties that would be qualified as near the political center, uh, or traditionally conservative, lost over 2.5 million votes combined. The big winners were the two parties that could not have been more opposed to the other. The German Communist gained 1.3 million votes, bringing them up to 4.5 million voters and 77 seats, and of course the National Socialist Party that gained a staggering 5.5 million votes, bringing their total up to 6.3 million, catapulting them from ninth to the second largest party in Germany. The growth and support for these two parties came from across the geographic and demographic landscape. They were both well supported by new voters, with almost a quarter of those who voted for the Nazi party being first-time voters. The Nazi party also did very well among women, which was an important voting demographic in Germany during this time period due to the number of male casualties during the First World War, which skewed gender demographics within the nation. One of the key messages of the Nazi party after the election was that it had done very well throughout all of Germany and throughout all of society, allowing them to make the claim that they appealed to a wider base than any other party, even if it wasn't the largest. The growth of two of the most radical parties, the Communists and the Nazis, had an important impact on the Reichstag. For a new cabinet to be formed, it needed a majority in the Reichstag. However, with the Nazi Party and the Communist Party now occupying so many seats, getting to that majority became incredibly difficult. A right-wing coalition, which would of course exclude the Social Democrats and the Communists, was impossible unless it would include the support of the Nazi Party. On the left, the math was essentially impossible, because even if the communists and the social democrats could somehow work together, which was already very unlikely, it would leave them with just under 38% of the votes, and they would be hard up to find coalition partners. This is why, in many ways, the 1930 election was the moment that broke the Weimar Republic. It was a system that needed some kind of coalition majority to function, and now there is almost no chance of that coalition being formed. The only real path for such a majority was for the center and the right to join in coalition with the Nazi party. This would require the party, but mostly Hitler, to accept being a member of a coalition, and importantly, not the leader of that coalition, which was unacceptable. 
This refusal to enter into a coalition without being the primary partner and without Hitler being chancellor would be the position of the Nazi party until 1933. While the 1930 election made it challenging for a government to form, it also was the beginning of a period in which it was hard for the Reichstag to function at all. Before 1930, the Reichstag was in session for about 100 days per year. In the six months after the 1930 election, it would meet 50 times, which was normal, but then the number of sessions would fall off a cliff. Between March 1931 and July 1932, that's over a year, it would spend just 24 total days in session, and then only three sessions would occur in this last six months of 1932. To continue to have a national government at all, Brüning, who was still in the position of chancellor, would be forced to use emergency decrees, 44 of them altogether. These decrees were included in the Constitution for just such an occasion, but it was never imagined that they would be used on this scale. In fact, from the 1930 election until 1933, the nation was essentially run on emergency decrees. While this was happening, the political violence, which had already been happening before 1930, just escalated. The Social Democrats, having been clearly defeated at the voting box by parties which endorsed this violence, began to move towards supporting it as well. The leaders of the party would call this period the War of Symbols, and they would join together with the trade unions, other working class organizations, and the Reichsbanner, a paramilitary group, to form the Iron Front, designed to fight back against the continued rise of fascism and communism in Germany. This change went hand in hand with changes within the Social Democratic Party as a whole, as they embraced the propaganda methods of their two largest rivals, the Communists and the Nazis. Their message became one that emphasized emotions and, and public displays of collective will instead of their traditional emphasis on reason and science. However, this new style would never really fit with the Social Democratic Party in the way that it did with their opponents. At its core, the party was simply not set up for such actions, both from a leadership as well as from the rank and file, and it showed. That did not mean that these actions did not increase the political volatility throughout Germany. As Thomas Childers would say in his work The Third Reich, quote, as the violence escalated, a culture of political martyrdom emerged on both sides of the ideological divide. Men felled in heroic battle with the partisan enemy were given elaborate funerals attended by party dignitaries, guarded by paramilitary troops, and given extensive coverage in party press, end quote. The victims of political violence were becoming heroes. With violence increasing in the spring of 1931, Bruning announced an emergency decree in March, which required all political meetings to be registered with local governments and the police. While the announced intention was to reduce the level of violence, it also had the effect of censoring groups that the authorities, and especially the police, did not agree with, which meant that the parties on the left would experience no small amount of discrimination due to existing views within the police force. The election would also be a turning point when it came to support for the Nazi party within the industrialists and among the army leadership. In 1931, support among business leaders from some of the larger industrial firms began to increase rapidly, which meant more money for the party and also more opportunities to speak to wealthy and influential individuals in the industrial areas. As with many relationships between rising politicians and wealthy business owners, the German industrialists hoped that if they bankrolled further Nazi campaigns, the party would create a new government which was tied to their interests. After contacts increased with the industrialists during the spring of 1931, Hitler and other top Nazi party leaders would make a concerted effort during the summer to grow and strengthen this relationship, knowing that such support would be important if the party was to take the next steps towards their final goals. A similar shift in attitude was happening in the army as well. There was already strong support for the Nazi party within the ranks of the army, just as there was support for other political parties as well. But after the elections and with the greatly increased public support for the party, among the upper echelons of army leadership there was a growing belief that perhaps the Nazi party was not the worst option when it came to who should lead Germany in the future. It helped that one of the core messages of the Nazi party from the very beginning had been a strong support for increasing the strength of the German army and undoing the humiliations that Versailles had placed upon what had been one of the strongest armies in Europe. Even though the Nazi party was coming off of a huge victory, it very quickly became apparent that all was not well within the party. 
The most important problem was the growing discontent among the ranks of the SA. After 1925, there had always been tension between Hitler and the political leaders of the party on one side and the leaders of the SA and the paramilitary on the other. At the time of the elections of 1930, the SA in Berlin was led by Walter Stenz, who made his displeasure clear during August 1930. Stenz, like many others within the SA, was growing frustrated with the slow progress, or to use his words, timidity and cowardice, of the Nazi political leaders. While Stenz was the first and most open about the situation, there had been concerns within the SA for years, with many members viewing the organization as the one that was created for and existed to launch a revolution. As the political side of the party, or the leaders of the party, who wanted to pursue the goals of the party through legal political means, grew in strength and popular support, there was a growing concern that the more radical and revolutionary elements of the party would be sidelined. The SA viewed themselves as one of the primary reasons that the party had grown in support. They had put their blood, sweat, and tears into the party, and they did not want their revolutionary mission to be snatched away from them by moderation that was creeping into the party. Stenz would move in August 1930, at which point he would write a letter to Munich making demands, including a guarantee of leadership placements for SA men. The Berlin SA, of which Stenz was the leader, appeared to be on the verge of leaving the party, and they even threatened to do so and it was only by Hitler's direct intervention that the crisis was averted, or as it turns out, delayed. It would be delayed until that decree I mentioned earlier, which Bruning put in place in March 1931 to attempt to place some government control over political meetings in Germany. Stenz was not a big fan of any attempt by the Weimar government to control the SA, but the Nazi political leaders did not want to resist this new decree, which Stenz felt was simply unacceptable. He declared that he was leaving the party and he was taking the Berlin SA with him and as much as he could of all of the SA in Eastern Germany. He would seize the party headquarters in Berlin and publish an article in Der Angriff, the Berlin party newspaper. In the article, he would claim that Hitler's actions were un-German and displayed boundless party despotism and irresponsible demagogy. The overall rebellion of the Berlin SA would be short, and the party would be able to rely on the police to expel them from the party headquarters, and after this was done, the resistance from the SA members would dwindle. Stenz would be expelled from the party, and 500 other SA members would go with him. Interestingly enough, while this was the most direct confrontation that would occur between Hitler and the SA during this period, it actually ended up helping the party, for two important reasons. The first was that, by taking the legal route against men of his own party, men who had supported him for over a decade, Hitler convinced many people within the nation that he was serious in his conviction to only pursue greater power via legal means. The second was that Hitler would recall Ernst Röhm from his time in the Bolivian army in South America. He would offer Rome a position as leader of the SA, in the hopes that Rome would be able to control what was becoming a, a very problematic wing of the party. There were many within the party leadership team that did not want Rome to be brought back. He had left the party in 1925, and some were concerned that his return would reduce their own influence. They would use the excuse of concerns about some of the details of Rome's personal life, but Hitler believed that he was the right person for the job, and Hitler trusted his leadership ability. Rome would return in late 1930, and as the leader of the SA, he would be a critical piece of the party for the next four years, until in 1934, he wasn't. But that is a story for a later episode. Next episode, we will discuss something that was happening for only the third time in the Weimar Republic, a presidential election, which occurred every seven years, and would occur in 1932.